Good morning and good evening to each and every one of you out there, literally around the world. We're so happy you're checking in with us. I got to tell you, there is so much activity going on here now at the port with cruise ships coming and going, getting their provisions, crew coming in, getting their vaccinations. We've got cargo ships and it's going to be one busy day for us today, but we like busy. We like doing the Lord's work. We like encouraging each and every one of you. And that's exactly what I pray we will do today as we have Chaplain Steve uh, giving you a message from Ezra chapter 4. And we've got Wendy singing. Encouragement, encouragement, encouragement. That is always our prayer for each and every one of you. But more importantly, we hope and pray that you have Jesus Christ in your heart. He is your Lord, your personal Lord and Savior. And you are walking with him each and every day of your breathing lives. And, and we're just happy to just be connected to you and be a part of all of that. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, shall we? Precious Lord, we thank you. We thank you for first your son. Thank you for loving us when we were unlovable. Thank you for loving us in our sinful states and saving us from that and giving us eternal life with you. But as we walk this earth to give us the strength and the comfort and the encouragement and the wisdom to to just navigate through all of the various situations and circumstances that come our way. Lord, we want to glorify you. We want to honor you with our lives. So, Lord, as we, we worship you now in song and as we take in your word, feed our souls, Lord, and, uh, and use us for your glory and honor and praise. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Here's Wendy. All right, sing along with me. All right. Greater is he that is in me, greater is he that is in me, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Great and mighty is the Lord our God, great and mighty is he, great and mighty is the Lord our God, great and mighty is he. Lift up your banner, let the anthems ring. Praises to our King. Great and mighty is the Lord our God. Great and mighty is He. Great and mighty is the Lord our God. Great and mighty is He. Well, that didn't take very long to draw a tear. What a privilege it is to listen to this lady sing. My goodness gracious. Okay, I hope you can all hear me okay out there. Let me get my material pulled up. There it is. Awesome. Wow, looking a little crooked here today, but that's okay. Did you ever have the best intention on doing something and have someone just turn against you for kind of no apparent reason, and it ended up forcing you to stop? Well, we're going to be looking at a message, something along those lines today as we, we proceed into Ezra chapter 4, verses 1 through 23. But before we get moving along here on that, um, I just want to thank you all. Welcome to the Canaveral Port Ministry Ways of Hope Chapel. I am Chaplain Steve McCrory, and it's my privilege today to lead us in an examination of Ezra chapter 4, verses 1 through 23. And as I mention about every week, um, it's important when we look at Scripture to understand a little bit about the context, or at least a bit, of what's going on before, during, and after what we're studying. And as we pick up from last week, we continue our march through the Bible as we examine 2 Kings chapter 20. And we've covered some ground since then. So in chapter 21, Manasseh ruled in Judah, and then Ammon ruled in Judah. In chapter 22, Josiah ruled in Judah, and that was followed by Hilkiah. And, or I mean, Hilkiah then discovered God's law. In chapter 23, we read of Josiah's religious reforms. Josiah celebrated Passover. Jehoahaz ruled in Judah, and then Jehoiakim ruled in Judah. Then in chapter 24, Jehoiachin, not to be confused with Kim, ruled in Judah, and then Zedekiah ruled, and then came the fall of Jerusalem. In chapter 25, the temple was destroyed, Gedaliah uh, governed in Judah, Israel was exiled to Babylon, but there was still hope for Israel's royal line. As we left 2 Kings, we bunny-hopped past Chronicles and moved into the book of Ezra, 
Um, Ezra was a religious leader of the Jews, and in chapter 1, King Cyrus had allowed the exiles to return to Israel. In Ezra 2, exiles who returned with Zerubbabel are listed, and in Ezra 3, the altar is rebuilt and the people begin to rebuild the temple. Which leads us to Ezra 4, verses 1 through 23 in our passage for today. But as I always like to do, let's peek forward. In chapter 5, we read of Tatanai's letter to King Darius, and in chapter 6, Darius approves the rebuilding. Um, the temple is dedicated, the celebration of Passover is observed, and then in chapter 7, um, Ezra, uh, it's recorded that Ezra's uh, arrival in Jerusalem, uh, Artaxerxes' letter to Ezra, and Ezra's praise of the Lord. And in chapter 8, um, exiles who returned with Ezra are listed, and Ezra's journey to Jerusalem is recorded. Chapter 9, Ezra's prayer concerning intermarriage is stated, and in chapter 10, the people confess their sin, and those who were guilty of intermarriage are listed. Then we're heading into Nehemiah. And in Nehemiah chapter 1, Nehemiah's concern for Jerusalem is recorded. In chapter 2, Nehemiah goes to Jerusalem and inspects Jerusalem's walls. And then in chapter 3, the rebuilding of the walls of Jerusalem is where we'll pick up next time. So let's back up. Let's back the truck up and go back to our passage for today, way back in Ezra. Ezra chapter 4, verses 1 through 23, and as I typically do, I read out of the NLT, the New Living Translation. Again, many of the people that are watching, English is perhaps their second, third, fourth language, so we like to try to present it in a fashion that's easily um, uh, absorbed. And what we're reading about here is enemies opposing the rebuilding. So as I begin in chapter 4, the enemies of Judah and Benjamin heard that the exiles were rebuilding a temple to the Lord, the God of Israel. So they approached Zerubbabel and the other leaders and said, Let us build with you, for we worship your God just as you do. We have sacrificed to him ever since King Esarhaddon of Assyria brought us here. But Zerubbabel, Jeshua, and the other leaders of Israel replied, You may have no part in this work. We alone will build the temple for the Lord the God of Israel, just as King Cyrus of Persia commanded us. Then the local residents tried to discourage and frighten the people of Judah to keep them from their work. They bribed agents to work against them and to frustrate their plans. This went on during the entire reign of King Cyrus of Persia and lasted until King Darius of Persia took the throne. Years later, when Xerxes began his reign, the enemies of Judah wrote a letter of accusation against the people of, Jews, of Judah and Jerusalem. Even later, during the reign of Artaxerxes of Persia, the enemies of Judah, led by Bishlam, Mithridath, and Tabiel, sent a letter to Artaxerxes in the Aramaic language, and it was translated for the king. Rehum, the governor, and Shimshai, the court secretary, wrote the letter telling King Artaxerxes about the situation in Jerusalem. They greeted the king for all their colleagues, the judges and local leaders, the people of Tarpel, the Persians, the Babylonians, and the people of Iraq and Susa, uh, that is Elam. They also sent greetings from the rest of the people whom the great noble Ashur ben Nippal had deported and relocated in Samaria throughout the neighboring lands of the province west of Euphrates River. This is a copy of their letter. To King Artaxerxes uh, from your loyal subjects in the province west of the Euphrates River. The king should know that the Jews who came here to Jerusalem from Babylon are rebuilding this rebellious and evil city. They have already laid the foundation and will soon finish its walls. And the king should know that if this city is rebuilt and its walls are completed, it will be much to your disadvantage. For the Jews will then refuse to pay their tribute, customs, and tolls to you. Since we are your loyal subjects and do not want to see the king dishonored in this way, we have sent the king this information. We suggest that a search be made in your ancestors' records where you will discover what a rebellious city this has been in the past. In fact, it was destroyed because of its long and troublesome history of revolt against the kings and countries who controlled it. We declare to the king that if this city is rebuilt and its walls are completed, the province west of the Euphrates River will be lost to you. Then King Artaxerxes sent this reply to Rehum the governor, Shimshai the court secretary, and the colleagues living in Samaria and throughout the province west of the Euphrates River, greetings. 
The letter you sent has been trans translated and read to me. I ordered a search of the records and have found that Jerusalem has indeed been a hotbed of insurrection against many kings. In fact, rebellion and revolt are normal there. Powerful kings have ru ruled over Jerusalem and the entire province west of the Euphrates River, receiving tribute, customs, and tolls. Therefore, issue orders to have these men stop their work. That city must not be rebuilt except at my express command. Be diligent. And don't neglect this matter, for we must not permit this, the situation to harm the king's interest. When this letter from King Artaxerxes was read to Rehum and Shimshai, the, their colleagues, they hurried to Jerusalem. Then with a show of strength, they forced the Jews to stop building. That was a big chapter. In review, Ezra, uh, Ezra 4 attempts to stop the work. From this point onwards, right to the end of Nehemiah, there is conflict. Nothing that is attempted for God will now go unchallenged, and scarcely a tactic will be unexplored by the opposition. We read of the offer of a dangerous alliance in verses 1 and 2. Adversaries try to join the work of building the temple. Judea was not completely empty of inhabitants during the time of the captivity. There was a remnant uh, descended from the lowest and the poorest of the land that was left behind in the exile combined with a few who had drifted into the largely desolate area. There were people who were not happy that Judah and Benjamin had come back to Judea, and thus they were their adversaries. Largely, these were the early Samaritans, those who were brought into the lands of the former kingdom of Israel after its fall to the Assyrians, and those who intermarried with those left behind from the exile. In the generations of exile after the fall of the kingdom of Judah, they had also expanded somewhat into the lands of Judah. The Samaritans continued as a people into New Testament times. Because the Samaritans had some historical connection to the people of Israel, their faith was a combination of law and ritual from the law of Moses and various superstitions. Most Jews in Jesus' time despised the Samaritans even more than the Gentiles because they were, religiously speaking, half-breeds who had an eclectic, mongrel sort of faith. This context is essential in understanding the parable of the Good Samaritan that we read of in Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 27. Great parable. The noise from the dedication ceremony at the end of Ezra 3 got the attention of these scattered peoples, signaling them that the returning Jews were serious about reestablishing a permanent presence in Judea. They wanted to become partners in the building work yet they were still adversaries. They wanted to partner in the work either to ruin it or to influence it to their benefit. Their subsequent conduct was so bitterly ill-natured Ill that we are driven to think that they must have had some selfish aims from the first. They did this on the claim that we seek your God as you do. Well, they probably said this with all sincerity. They genuinely believed that they sought the same God in the same way, Yet, they also added, and we have sacrificed to him since the days of Esau Hayden, king of Assyria. This means that they sacrifice without either a temple or a priesthood, which was obviously against the commandment of God. This commandment completely, I mean, this completely contradicted their claim, we seek your God as you do. To the Samaritans, Yahweh, or God, was one of many powerful gods. Their idolatry represented a grave danger because Israel was exiled for their idolatry. This was a dangerous partnership for the returned exiles. In verse 3, Zerubbabel rightly refuses their offer. Importantly, their response was unified. All the returned exiles were agreed upon this answer to the Samaritans. With one voice, they refused the help of the Samaritans. And they did this knowing they had the permission, even the command, of King Cyrus, and knowing they lacked both human and financial resources. It was an important step of faith to refuse a partnership that might have seemed helpful. We can imagine that there were a few pragmatists among them who said, we need any help we can get. We can guard ourselves against ungodly influences they may bring. In weak or early circumstances of a building work, there is often serious temptation uh, to take any help and to ignore the dangers of unwise and ungodly partnerships. 
The Samaritans did not worship Jehovah, Jehovah as did the Jews, but also along with their own gods. To divide his dominion with others was to essentially dethrone him altogether. It was therefore became an act of faithfulness to Jehovah to reject the entangling alliance. Moving forward, we see the broad outline of Samaritan resistance to the work in Jerusalem. In verses 4 and 5, we see the resistance under, under the reign of Cyrus. Their response to the refusal of partnership revealed their evil intent. If they could not attack the work through a subversive partnership, they would then attack the work through discouraging the workers, troubling the builders, and lobbying against them in the court of King Cyrus. Today's passage presents a broad overview of the Samaritan resistance to the work of rebuilding the temple and the city of Jerusalem that extends into the days of Nehemiah. We see that the work of building the temple was interrupted for several years during the reign of Cyrus until the reign of Darius, king of Persia. Even after the temple was finished under Zerubbabel, the Samaritans continued to oppose the work of rebuilding the city of Jerusalem, and this ongoing resistance is briefly chronicled in this section of Ezra. In verse 6, we read of the resistance under the reign of Xerxes. The Samaritan adversaries against the people of Judah sought to stop the work through influencing the king against the builders. This showed a true enterprising spirit among the adversaries of God's people. They were wrong, but they were energetic and enterprising in their wrong work. In verses 7 through 16, we read of the resistance under the reign of Artaxerxes. This indicates that the work they complained against was not the work of rebuilding the temple, because that work was already completed. This was resistance to the work of rebuilding the city and its walls. They will not pay tax, tribute, or custom was a lie and a false accusation. They recalled the prior sins of Israel, the rebellious and evil city, and attributed them to these chastened, returned exiles. They skillfully shaped their words to claim they were supporting and protecting the king, cleverly calling attention to Jerusalem's sinful past the Samaritans argued that allowing the building work to continue would make it so that the king of Persia would have no dominion beyond the river. Their attack by letter was a skillful combination of truth and lies. It was true that Jerusalem had a sinful past, yet with these returned exiles, it was truly the past and not the present. However, that truth was completely irrelevant because of the great lie, the lie that Jews and the builders of Jerusalem had a rebellious intent. In verses 17 through 23, the king commands that the work stop until further notice. The Samaritan letter to stop the work was a combination of truth and lies, and here the Persian king focused on the truth in the letter, the sinful and tragic past of Jerusalem. Artaxerxes also noted that in times past, there were, in fact, powerful kings of Judah who had the power to tax and impose tribute on their neighbors. In his mind, it meant that Judah had the potential to return to this powerful past. The letter from the Samaritan adversaries was successful. Artaxerxes, king of Persia, perhaps the most powerful man in the world at that time, commanded that the work be stopped. The adversaries made the most of the decree of Artaxerxes and used it to make the work stop immediately. In closing, I think it's very important that we recognize that our primary and biggest adversary, Satan and his demons, who are our enemies, also use the same ploy of assaulting us with a combination of truth and lies. They remind us of our sins, which are usually true, but then weave in lies to cast doubts about ourselves and the awesomeness of our Lord and his love for us. And like the Samaritans did, Satan likewise brings his accusations before the great king, our Lord and God. Fortunately, by mercy and grace, our God never forsakes those who place their faith in his son, Christ Jesus, who restores our relationship with the great king. God loves you. He loves us. God remains sovereign. Even though we don't deserve it, when we turn from our sins and repent, God extends his mercy and grace. Yes, God expects obedience in our relationship with him. And yes, we are to seek his ways, his will, and his wisdom. 
But unfortunately, from time to time, we all fail. When we are honest, we all know that we have done, thought, or said bad things, which the Bible calls sin. The Bible confirms in Romans 3.23 that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And the result of sin is death, spiritual separation from God. But do not be afraid of that. God loves you and has a plan for you. You see, the Bible says God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, Jesus Christ, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. John 3.16 Jesus said, I came that they, that's us, may have life and have it abundantly, a complete life full of purpose. God is on the throne and does things according to his will. God knows that we are incapable on our own to have the relationship with him that he designed us to have and one that we so desperately need. But God's love for us is without measure, so much so that he provides us a bridge of forgiveness through Christ Jesus to have a restored and everlasting relationship with him. God sent his son to die in our place to pay the debt for our sins, which must be paid to have a restored relationship with God. Jesus died in our place so we could be forgiven of our sins and have that priceless relationship with God and be with him forever. God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, but it didn't end with his death on the cross. He rose again and still lives. Christ died for our sins. He was buried. He was raised on the third day, according to scriptures. Make no mistake, Jesus is the only way to God. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. So the question today might be, would you like to receive God's forgiveness? We are only saved by God's grace and we have faith in his son, Jesus Christ. All you have to do is acknowledge that you're a sinner, believe that Christ is the Son of God, that he died for your sins, and ask forgiveness. Then turn from your sins. That's called repentance. Jesus Christ knows you and loves you. What matters to him is the attitude of your heart, your honesty. The Bible also tells us that Jesus will be with us forever. He will never forsake us. If you would like to invite and receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior, you can do so right now. We are to come as we are. And now is the time. Friends, we can't earn forgiveness of our sins and restore our relationship with God on our own or by trying to be good. If we could, Jesus would not have had to step down from heaven and die on the cross for our sins. And yes, there is urgency. Not one of us knows when our time here will end. Now is the time to embrace God's love for us. To be in a restored relationship with God, we must acknowledge that we sin and need to be forgiven. We need to trust in and profess Jesus Christ as Lord, that he paid for our sins on the cross and was raised from the dead according to Scripture. We need to turn from our worldly, sinful ways and embrace God's holy and pure ways. Would you like to receive him today? Jesus knows you and loves you. He is knocking on the door of your heart right now. Will you let him in? Do not be deceived by the world, by Satan, who leverages all he can to stop you from rebuilding, from restoring your relationship with God. God wants to have a restored, everlasting relationship with you. You just need to take the step of faith to receive his priceless gift. As I do every week, I'm going to offer a prayer that if you would like to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior right now, whether you're watching this live or whether you're watching this as a recording sometime in the future, it doesn't matter. If you would like to receive Jesus right now, you can. And I'm going to lead us in a prayer to do just that, just a little prayer, just what I was just talking about. And you might have said this prayer before, but no, you've fallen way out of alignment with God's will in your life. Well, if you would like to get back into alignment, now is as good as time as any to start, and you're very welcome to say this prayer along with me. So if you join me in prayer. Dear Lord God, I confess that I'm a sinner and need forgiveness of my sins. Jesus, I believe you are the Son of God. 
that you died on the cross for my sins, that you rose from the grave according to Scripture. Jesus, I invite you right now into my heart, into my life as my Lord and my Savior. Jesus, please forgive me of my sins. Jesus, help me to turn from my sinful ways. Jesus, help me to embrace and follow your holy and pure ways. Jesus, thank you for loving me so much. In Jesus' precious name we pray, amen. And that concludes the presentation for this week. If you said this prayer along with me today for the first time or the second, third, or hundredth time, please let us know here at the ministry. We have materials that we would like to get into your hands to help you with your walk. Um, if you appreciate these messages that come out pretty much every day, um, you can help the cause by, by pressing that like button, by pressing that share button to move these messages further along. We already know that these messages go literally around the world. And, and who the targets are, we don't know. We just know that according to the Lord's will, um, they will find their mark. His word never returns void. And you can play a part in that by moving the message along a little bit more. Um, as Richard said earlier, we are excited. The, the ministry is abuzz with activity. The, the seafarers are just right at the threshold of returning, and it is just a very happy, joyful time. But please, please, please be mindful. COVID is not in the rearview mirror yet. Uh, please be careful. Please be safe. And, you know, if there's anything that we can do to help you in your walk with the Lord, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. So until next time, we just pray that you will all be safe and blessings to all.